to admonish sinners is not... <laughs> um, of course, there's a way to do it with a sledgehammer, or there's a way to do it with some honey, so to speak, to correct our neighbor, to draw them to the good of God's laws, and to show them the evil of, for example, living in a divorced state of life, or living in sin. So admonishing the sinner is part of the work of mercy. And St. Paul tells us, if you have to correct someone, do it with meekness, knowing that we ourselves also could fall. And then the other spiritual works of mercy, to instruct the ignorant, instructing the ignorant. And this is where publications come in, this is where radio broadcasts come in, this is where, um, for example, sermons and catechisms are publicized. They do teach the ignorant. And this is very important apostolate, to teach the, the ignorant. Um, because the light of the truth is a light of the mind. It illuminates the mind. It raises man's whole thinking, raises his whole morals. Because we must conform to God's law, to Christ the King, and obviously not Christ the King to man's laws. But that's the perversion of the modern world. He, man wants to make God his servant. But we are not. That's, that's absolutely what is the apostasy. And that man is the servant of God, and he must adore and believe all that he taught. So this great work of mercy, instructing the ignorant, is what's really lacking today. Because everyone is drowning in lies, heresies, and uh, the brainwash of the media. So, and many people don't care to hear it. They don't want to hear it. And this is where prayer for the living and the dead come in. We have to pray for our poor sinners. And Our Lady of Fatima begged us, pray for poor sinners. Because many go to hell because no one prays for them and does penance for them. So what is the best penance? Sister Lucia said, doing our duty of state as best we can. That's the greatest penance. And when you really think about it, it is. To try to do our state of life very well, as perfect as we can, we discover that in fact is the best penance. Because many souls will look for penances elsewhere when their real penance is just do what you're supposed to do in our duties of state. So to embrace these simple things with a generous heart. So let's learn from the Virgin Mary. She's always, she's always the treasure, the most perfect and beautiful treasure given by God to us. Because no one fears a mother. And this is also why God became a child, and even smaller than a child. He is so helpless, so to speak, in the Blessed Sacrament. How does he get there? Well, the priest must put him there. How does he get around to the sick? How is he given to you? The priest must give him to you. Our Lord is so submits himself to the hands of the consecrated hands of his priests. And this is such a lesson for all of us that our God becomes like, like a little helpless presence under a piece of bread. A substance under the bread. This is, and this teaches us itself. St. Peter Jill, Julian Amard, he has a whole, several chapters on the humility of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. And we think we're all that. <coughs> we think we all are blinded by pride. Yet our God is so small. To teach us, we must be small. We must be humble of heart. Know our place before God. That's why it's the, it's the greatest joy to kneel down and to converse with our God in the Blessed Sacrament. This is one of the greatest joys on this earth. And the Blessed Mother, she knew this. She was the first, really, to practice it. Really, in practice. She would kneel down and adore Christ in the tabernacle of her womb, the living God. So she's the first to teach us that love of the Blessed Sacrament, to love our Lord, and to converse with Him as to the closest friend, as to our God, with great adoration and humility of heart, like the angel of Fatima taught the children to profoundly bow before God. <clears throat> and, and the prayer of the humble heart, says St. James, pierces the clouds. Because God is moved to hear the humble heart. That's why Mother Church teaches us, 
the mass starts with the confidior. A man humbling himself before God. This is the, how we have to approach God with a great humility of heart and to adore Him. So offer this, this adoration of this mass and our Lord stays here in this blessed sacrament. It's a rare privilege for this, this family, for this block, for this whole part of the city. It influences the whole city, Christ present here. And everywhere where we have our chapels, people notice this, who, not, who are not even Catholic. They say, you know, fathers, since you moved in here, there's something different about our village, something different about the neighborhood here. And the crime is less. And things are, there's less uh, drug dealing, there's, there's more, there's just something different that's good about it. And we hear that quite often. When we got the church down in St. Louis in the mid-90s, and it was in a rough part of town, the neighborhood was saying that. And <clears throat> in Philadelphia, where the chapel of Eddie Stone years ago, the presence of our Lord and all the angels that accompany him, there is, it affects the whole city, it affects the whole town, it affects. So here our Lord is here. So you who dwell here, um, you have a little Bethany. Bethany was where our Lord used to go to rest sometimes with Lazarus, St. Lazarus, St. Mary Magdalene, and St. Martha. They were brothers and sisters. And our Lord used to be there, and St. Mary Magdalene would sit at his feet and just adore him listen to him. So do that. Listen to our Lord. Speak with him. Come and make reparation. And seek light from him. Some of you are young here. And you gotta, you got to ask our Lord. Ask him. He knows. What do you want me to do with my whole life? Help me to see what your will is in my whole life. And our Lord, he, he makes it known in his time and in his way. Sometimes he doesn't let you know. So late, sometimes he lets you know early. But we got to always ask. It's very important. And so love our Lord. You have a heaven on earth, really. The only difference is we're in bodies, corporeal bodies, subject to the weakness of the body. And we don't see our Lord face to face as he in his beatific vision. But he's the same God here under the veils of the Blessed Sacrament. So this has always been the joy of Catholic. That no heretics have ever come to understand our love except those who converted. But this is such a treasure. And you look at past, <coughs> you know, all the ages of Christendom. This is the heart of hospitals, of convents, of nuns who run hospitals. Their strength is right here. Of contemplative orders of nuns and monks, their strength is here. Of all religious orders that teach, that take care of the sick, take care of the elderly, that, that take care of prostitutes or sinners, their strength is always here. And in the old Catholic villages and cities and towns, always the, the life was centered around the altar, and the presence of Christ. Families would come in during the day. Dads sometimes late after work come and visit the Blessed Sacrament before they go home. And during the night, sinners would come in. And, and devout people come to make an adoration in the middle of the night, because churches used to never be closed, never. And always people would come to visit our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And this is what was the, the hidden stream of life, so to speak, in Christendom. The hidden bloodstream in the Catholic city is that continual love and adoration of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, uniting all our tears, our sacrifices, our life, our vows with Jesus crucified in the sacrifice of the Mass. Archbishop Lefebvre speaks about this a lot, how we must be victims with Christ, who is the victim on the altar on the cross. The victimhood of love, that's what we have to be in our, in our vocation of our life. So come and drink, my friends. Come and drink and be inebriated, says the Holy Ghost. Be inebriated with the love of God and his friendship. My delights are to be with the children of men. Because he loves to stay with Adam and Eve until they turn from him. <clears throat> he loves to stay with us, fallen race. 
and spend company with Him. Our Lord loves that. That's why He chose to do this. But think about the disaster of Vatican II. Our Lord is no longer loved, no longer adored. Very, very few adore Him in the Blessed Sacrament anymore. So try to make reparation for those who don't love our Lord. Isn't this not the prayer of Fatima taught by the angel, one of them? My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love thee. And I beg pardon for those who don't believe, do not adore, do not hope in thee, and do not love thee. So we, we have to make reparation. So let's go now to this great sacrifice. The sacrifice takes place. Our Lord gives you his body, blood, soul, and divinity. And then our Lord stays here in the tabernacle. And those are the two distinct parts of the Holy Eucharist. The sacrifice and the sacrament. They're not to be confused. And Archbishop Lefebvre complained that some catechisms only stress the sacramental part, but forget the sacrifice part. And that's the Mass. And this is what has been under attack, of course, since the new Mass. So let's love the Mass. Love our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Love God and run with the legs of the love of God and neighbor towards heaven. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us, 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 O M